Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the Gold Silver Bitcoin Show brought to you by the goldsilverbitcoin.com store. We are more than honored to be sitting down with Mike McLone. He is a Bloomberg commodities and crypto strategist. Thank you so much, Mike, for sitting down with us. Hello, hello, Justin. Well, thank you for having me. So I came across an article recently about some of your work. It was published in CryptoGlobe.com, and they discussed that in a tweet, you revealed that U.S. patriotism could help Bitcoin's price move up as the U.S. dollar's dominance, tax revenue, and other factors could lead to to the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission to allow a Bitcoin exchange-traded fund to trade on U.S. exchanges. On the note of kind of patriotism and Bitcoin, when I was at attending Bitcoin 2021 in 2021, I think that uh, I noticed a clear overlap between the conservative sentiments in the United States and where Bitcoin had evolved. So Bitcoin was founded, some argue, based on Austrian type economic ideas and I th- people have noted that some of the earliest participants in the Bitcoin ecosystem were libertarians as well, generally speaking. This is generally speaking. There's also a niche of uh, cyberpunks. And and when I bring that up, that this was also a a segment of early Bitcoin, people will point out that oftentimes the cyberpunks and the libertarians themselves are overlapping. However, when I was at Bitcoin 2021, I noticed that there was this clear kind of uh, thread of conservatism that appeared there. I was speaking with an individual who's in the industry, more on the cryptocurrency side, which has a different kind of feel or culture. And he noted that he felt like he was at a Q rally. I only bring that up because he was absolutely right that 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 in, in terms of I don't agree with his what the sentiment behind what he was saying. However, I, I had observed a similar phenomenon was this overlap between conservatism and Bitcoin. So when I saw saw your article, I knew that there was a it was a, something that I had observed as well. So could you kind of uh, t- walk us through this tweet and? Uh, why you think U.S. patriotism could be a boon to Bitcoin? Um, most notably because um, the arch rival to the U.S. now China has completely banned anything that's non-Chinese based crypto, which gives the U.S. an impetus to make it successful. So imagine this, the narrative of 1.4 billion people not being allowed to access the internet by not, not being about that as it kicked off as electricity as it moved on as automobiles as airplanes and now they're not being allowed to get involved in digital assets most notably bitcoin ethereum nfts and crypto dollars um, <clears throat> as the world moves ahead and progresses and to me this is a classic case of of a pretty significant cold war developing centered in um, in cryptos um, so it's it's not so much, I mean, if there's any way to tilt the uh, a U.S. Um, politician, it's doing something that opposes the other side. In this kind of case, the main enemy is is uh, China, and it completely is tilt, tilted. So first, let's look at the facts, what's happened so far in 2021. I think we're going to look back at this year as a major transition where potentially the beginning of the end in Chinese Communist economy, Chinese economy Party, a peak in China and the U.S. accelerated. And just based on what we're seeing so far, these are just existing trends. The U.S. has launched Bitcoin ETF, Ethereum um, Ethereum, uh, futures. Canada has launched ETFs on both. Uh, Europe has launched ETFs on both. Um, And China's banned them completely. What's that trend? Um, Mr. Gensler became his SEC chairman. Yes, very controversial, but he did approve the first Bitcoin ETF. Yes, it's futures. It's a baby step. But to me, it's the U.S. getting there and as Churchill says, you know, we'll find, uh, find the right solution once we exhaust all possibilities. To me, that's what's happening. And now it made it almost just patriotic and within the U.S. vested interest from a security standpoint and adopting rapidly advancing technology rather than let it, rather than let it push you behind. It's the card and part of the U.S. vested interest. So what I see as the end game is some form of ETF tracking a broad based index that tracks spot cryptos, meaning right now we're kind of picking the top one or two, Bitcoin and Ethereum. But from a professional money manager standpoint, that's where the market at SEC should be going if we're truly out to protect investors, um, because that's what most investors want. They want an index for the stock market. They want an index for bonds. They want an index. So that's where we're going. We're, we're well on that path. And it's something I would have never predicted, but it's really the fact now. And that is um, every day that Bitcoin and Ethereum goes up is every day pressure for the Chinese Communist Party and then a lot of despondent 
citizens in China who are not being allowed to partake in this. Now, I'll end on this. The key thing I find out in the space is the most widely traded crypto assets are crypto dollars, stable coins, but they track the dollar, crypto dollars. And from my contacts in Asia, which I heard, um, Asian and Chinese, um, like when say investors, are some of the people who like to use them the most, and now they're precluded from doing so. Patrick Byrne was speaking at a Bitcoin conference 2021, and uh, he's a contro- controversial figure, speaking of which. And uh, I will say that Gary Gensler was given uh, approval at this conference as well by Senator Lummis in Wyoming, as yeah. well as a representative out of Ohio. I believe Davidson was his name. And they both said that Gary Gensler was Bitcoin friendly. And uh, Patrick Byrne there talked about how Bitcoin's ideas in a talk that he had given in 2014 were kind of uh, a continuation of the classical liberal ideas that upon which the United States were founded. And I, I think that like your, what you're laying out here is, is not necessarily the same argument, maybe a parallel argument, which could a historian might uh, gather and, and throw together at a, a much later day in the future. We also see a little bit of a trend on the, on the mining side. There's always been concern that there's a lot of mining in China. Miners uh, flourished in China because of cheap electronics, cheap energy as well. However, the heavy-handed approach of the Chinese state there has pushed um, miners into North America in the United States. And one of the main arguments for that is the rule of law here and the clarity, regulatory clarity on that front. Here in Washington uh, state, just probably about four hours uh, west of me, there was a burgeoning little uh, Bitcoin mining town due to a due to location to uh, hydroelectric Electricity, and uh, although I think that the town took measures in order to ensure that their town didn't become a Bitcoin mining city, it I think was a harbinger for what is still developing today, which is a, a more robust Bitcoin mining infrastructure in North America. Do you take that into your uh, price targets sure. at all, or any other factors? Well, absolutely. Well, sir, first of all, the, the simplistic way of, of commodity strategies or any market strategies is supply, demand, and price. Supply in Bitcoin is fixed, 900 coins a day to 2024, and then it drops to 450, and then it drops to half that. We know how that works. Check mark, can't change it. Enough said. All that matters is demand, and all that matters from price standpoint is demand and adoption. And those are clearly moving higher, so price must go higher by real economics. It's just a question of how you measure and quantify that. The fact that what happened this year was one of those other key things was a key concern about cryptocurrencies in Bitcoin at the beginning, there's, oh, it's concentrated, the hash rate and the mine is concentrated in, in China. Poof, that's gone. That issue is gone. It's another major bullish thing for Bitcoin. And your point is clear. A lot of that mining migrated towards North America, US and Canada. The main reason is obviously there's a lot of stranded energy that can be harnessed, i.e. Um, gas flaring. There's plenty of that going on in Texas and Canada, and it's just helping solve that problem. But the rule of law, um, and the key thing I, you mentioned, Bitcoin 2021, one thing I really enjoyed about that was um, a lot of the people I met that were mature adult business people, particularly uh, two in particular who ran energy businesses. They didn't really know about Bitcoin, but they got to Bitcoin as a way to help moderate and help govern, a, govern their excess supply. When they have excess supply and they can't really shut down, they need to do something with it. They can mine Bitcoin. And I was impressed with that. And there's a lot of that going on. Like you mentioned, the uh, hydroelectric plant up in uh, Washington. I've heard of miners using a lot of the abandoned hydroelectric plants up in Appalachian Mountains that were quite well used before NAFTA you know, kicked out all the textile um, companies. So there is, it's just, you know, it, it's one of the things you love about the space with new technology, just like you've heard about electricity and automobiles and trains. Is <clears throat> anybody who's disrupted and when people who are, you know, new to it initially will, can poo poo it. And certainly someone who's has a vested interest in, in it potentially replacing them or making them redundant will push back. But I look at the big picture and a key thing I love about what I do at Bloomberg on this terminal, I'm completely neutral. I write for the terminal. I write for the people who read the terminal and trickles up to Twitter and things like you. And it's got to be without a bias. This is where I think the market's going wide. It's well-researched data. And this is where I see it. It's, you know, it's just one of those classic examples of human nature. And we, we just checked off so many boxes this year. And I look at Bitcoin as way underperforming this year for a, the year after having. I was looking at you know, Ethereum up about 6x. Um, is really much more as what I was looking for Bitcoin. So I think Bitcoin is doing a little catch up now. Um, and uh, I, you know, I see the price continue to advance, but not without bumps in the row. I mean, there's massive speculative excesses in this space. 
uh, most noted with things like uh, Shiba Inu and Dogecoin and stuff like that. I mean, those. I, I did a little research on Shiba Inu a little while ago. I obviously kiboshed it a little bit by putting down just by publishing. Once it hits my radar, and then just point out it is a speculation machine. I was so impressed with it. But that's the key thing about this phase. NASA technology, speculation is involved. But in this case, we're seeing just revolution in digital assets and a better way of transacting and doing business on a global scale and uh, what you mentioned with this with china pushing back is let's look at i'll end with this let's look at the end game either okay they push back they completely ban they want to do their own good luck they either cave and say okay it's okay for citizens to get to allocate and to actually buy purchase and hold some bitcoin and ethereum whatever or they continue to push back which means you know they're just missing one of the best advances in modern financial utilization in history. I mean, crypto dollars are just predominant in this space. And that's probably one thing that they're not too happy with. You mentioned uh, the finite supply of Bitcoin in a world where there's really no other kind of corollary in terms of a hard cap. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins in existence. It's written in the code. People uh, point towards gold, for instance, at, or rather they look at how gold mining inspired Bitcoin mining. Some people say this term mining might not be the best term, but that's what it has been dubbed. So in the mining process, it's supposed to mimic gold. However, there is no hard cap on the amount of gold ounces that could ever exist, even though it is difficult to pull them out of the ground. Bitcoin is a much different animal insofar as there is this hard cap, 21 million, no, no more ever. What role does that play in your price analysis? And and how many people do you think are are looking at that fact and and uh, creating an investment thesis in Bitcoin around it? Um, uh, plays a lot, and I think a lot. And virtually every asset manager on the planet now knows they have to be in this space, at least from a partial allocation. And elasticity of supply, what you touched on, Justin, is the number one one of the number one factors, and that is we can see by code that NGU technology, number go up technology per supply in Bitcoin, is just clearly declining incrementally over time. Can't adjust that, it's per code. Ethereum just adopted the new EIP-1559 to do similar where it's NGU technology, number go up, the supply is declining. That's not the case in virtually any asset I've ever seen in my, in, in my life. You mentioned gold. The best way to bring on gold supply is to have the price go up. Um, and gold will always advance in price when measured versus fiat currencies, right? Because there's unlimited supply of dollars. There's certainly unlimited supply of Zimbabwe dollars and other currencies. But I like to say you can look at the S&P 500 in terms of gold, and it's like it's about the same four ounces as it was 30 years ago. Iowa farmland is about the same four ounces as it was 40 years ago. Yes, it fluctuates. The U.S. home is pretty stable in terms of ounces of gold. That's changing because gold is clearly being replaced by Bitcoin. And the way I look at gold now is I'm bullish gold. Um, I think gold gold's going to move up to $2,000 an ounce next year and stay above that forever because of how it is measured in dollars. There's unlimited supply of dollars. But if you measure in terms of Bitcoin, it's going to continue to decline. Um, and the problem is the world's rapidly going digital. Anybody who holds or allocates to gold now is basically potentially – not only a greater risk, potentially a poor fiduciary if they're not somewhat allocating some of that to Bitcoin because it's being replaced. The process is clear. It's just a question if you're going to expect it to end, good luck, potentially can accelerate. And did gold, Bitcoin's well in its way becoming digital collateral um, and it's replacing gold. So I'm not bearish, but that's a big difference for all other commodities. Number one is, is crude oil. Why is crude oil... Uh, a little bit more than half the price as it was at peak in 2008. Elasticity supply, U.S. has switched, switched from a net importer to a net export of crude oil because of technology. We can create more of it. We use less of it. Um, why is copper about the same price as it was 10 years ago? Because it can easily create more, even though there's more demand. And higher prices bring in more supply. So that's the number one unique thing about the top two. Bitcoin, number one. And Ethereum, number two, is that declining elasticity of supply. There is no elasticity of supply. So over time, I'm fundamentally bullish both. Just a question of how I measure that overbought, oversold. And I'm fundamentally bearish crude oil because it has been going down and elasticity of supply is only increasing demand, potentially increasing too. Elasticity of demand, meaning less demand when prices go up. Um, because just look at it 10 years from now, we're not going to need as much crude oil. I mean, we can go to Hertz and rent a Tesla nowadays. They've, you know, I 
electric car. I already have one. I have solar panels. It's just being replaced. Um, but not Bitcoin. It's actually in the early stages of adoption is the way I see it. It's still a very small portion of global portfolios. Now, we're going to hit the tape on this on um, November 10th. And this is November 9th. November 9th and one of the headlines is Apple C, um, Apple's Cook signals crypto interest, calls NFTs interest. And that's just like every smart, humble, well-thought-out, well-researched person on the planet now gets that hey, might as well allocate 1% to 2% in this space versus the risk of looking like I'm stupid and lost in the woods for not being part of the internet when I first got it started and electricity when it first adopted. And that's what uh, we're seeing in things like digital assets. The problem is there's 13,000 of them. Uh, you know, a year ago, there was 12. A year before that was only, I'm sorry, it was only six. It was half that. So it's just massive supply, mass, massive excesses. And so there'll be volatility. There'll be bumps and but the three, I'll end with these, the three musketeers I expect to remain the same. That's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and crypto dollars. When you look at the Bitcoin price, are there any sort of strategies that you develop in order to maybe understand it in new ways? It's a brand new asset. It is transparent in ways that certain other assets may or may not be. And then furthermore, um, I think that I, there is a burgeoning, I don't know how sophisticated it is, you know, behind closed doors, I think price analysis school that is probably taking interesting approaches to the data that's available on the Bitcoin price. So for instance, um, I think that uh, Jack Dorsey was able to predict a Bitcoin price based on block number. Are analysts perhaps looking at block numbers as a, as a betokening of certain prices? Or furthermore, um, I imagine that with X amount of Bitcoins having already been lost to date and some way to keep track of that, there might be some some ways in which to create a equation to predict how once the last Bitcoin has been mined, what percentage overall will have been lost. And therefore, what will the real supply be at that point? Of course, you never know if somebody's going to remember their password or, or what have you, but are, are, have you seen any unique price analysis strategies that have been deployed against Bitcoin that couldn't be deployed against any other commodity? Well, I think the one that's most significant for this, um, this program is stock to flow. Um, and that is um, what's the overall stock versus total flow. Now, the only rival to Bitcoin ever realistically is gold. And Bitcoin is a much better stock to flow trajectory than Bitcoin. So I think it was B2B. There's a lot of people who do um, the stock to flow and 100,000 was basically kind of the next threshold target. I've used a number of different method methodologies. And I look at 100,000 as the next key resistance th threshold target in Bitcoin. Um, and I use different stories, but I completely agree with the stock. To flow. I just try to create my own on the terminal. I was not happy with the back test, although the forward looks great. So, but there's a number of ways. And it's one thing I, I, I learned early, early on in this business, Justin, working in the Chicago trading pits in the 80s is I would be in an, a row with a dozen people We're all on the phones dealing with institution customers. And every one of us had a different way of looking at the market and everyone was legitimate and valid as long as it worked for you and helped you give an edge. So my, um, the way I typically have switched this year is much less fundamental and much more transitionary paradigm shifting. Like I sense what's happening in this space. And everybody sees it now that the demand is overwhelming to get me in. If I'm not in, I feel left behind sense. And the headlines are just trickling down. every day. I just mentioned Apple. That's just one. Just Bank of America and uh, JP Morgan recently put out research, research reports saying how, you know, bullish the space is. Uh, two years ago, you would, that would have been a dream. To me, that's what's happening. It's in the early stages. So I gave, I put down a little bit of the on-chain metrics I was looking at because I thought they were a little too granular, a little too much in the trees and focused more in the forest. And so far it's worked um, so far this year. I mean, I just, prices should go higher. It's a question how much higher. And my technicals have worked pretty well there. Um, I see, like I see Ethereum now bumping up against good resistance around 5,000, good support around 4,000. That technical, not too complicated. I mean, and Ethereum, I, I mean, I think Bitcoin is probably going to get to that $100,000 threshold. It's a question of when and then how it reacts. And I fully expect one key thing to continue happening is, is volatility to continue to decline in the space. And now one way I'll measure that is versus gold. So to me, volatility is all relative. I mean, X options traders, you look at annual volatility in Bitcoin. Um, when the first Bitcoin ETFs were launched in 2017. It was about eight. Annual volatility in Bitcoin was about 8x that of gold. Now it's 4x. Now that's 260 days of actual business days. Where's that going? 
clearly heading lower, which means Bitcoin's running into mainstream. So I look at a lot of those technical indicators. I look at a lot of things like Bitcoin, uh, like, uh, um, like volatility. A key thing that got me really bullish back in in uh, April, May, when it collapsed from 60 to 30. And first, I have to admit, I did not think it would do that right away. I thought 40 to 50 would hold support, partly because I'm fundamentally bullish. I knew it was overbought, but I have to be careful putting out bearish sell signals. But it did do it. And once it did correct, the relative to its 20-week moving average on some of my other indicators got the cheapest it was since the bottom in 2018. I'm like, okay, fundamentally bullish, massive speculative flush. You got to flush out the week longs of which I used to be when I was in the pit trader, got caught on the wrong side of a lot of trades, flush them out back to the enduring bull market. And that's one key thing benefit that cryptos have had. And part of the reason they're making new highs this year, and I think stronger highs is Bitcoin and Ethereum both corrected at least almost 50%. That cleanses the market. The stock market hasn't had more than a 10% correction measured by the S&P 500 since last year's low. So at some point, that's going to happen. And that's not profound. It's the question of what that means for the macro. Because I fully expect that's just really bullish for Bitcoin in the big picture. And in, in, in the meantime, everything's correlated when the stocks only go up and the Fed supports them. But once the stock market wobbles, say if it do- drops 10 to 20 percent, initially cryptos will decline, but then they should be better off as the Fed switches to more QE, easier rates, you know, trying to fight deflationary trends helps Bitcoin accelerate its path to be, um, um, which I view as just a price discovery stage. It's still early days of that. And I view NEC as 100,000 as the next key level for that price discovery stage. Before we talk about $100,000 Bitcoin and then even million dollar Bitcoin, which some people are predicting. And when you look at charts, just a quick glance at a chart, I mean, Bitcoin looks a lot closer to a million dollars than $4 where it was in 2012 <laughs> when I first started participating in the market. Yeah. But um, I think uh, on the quite, uh, so March, 2012, President Trump announces that there's no more travel from Europe to the United States and the markets essentially collapse, very quick collapse, but nonetheless, they, the bottom fell out of, of many different assets and commodities. And so Bitcoin actually, you know, dropped, I, I can't remember the numbers. I'm going to say it was at 13,000 to 5,000, 10 to 5,000, <laughs> but yeah. very quickly rebounded. In fact, I think rebounded yeah. almost quicker than any commodity on the planet. Yeah. What did that signal to you? More of the same. We expect more of that in the future. He made, he made the March March 2020. It sometimes I mix up. I, we all know you meant 2020. Um, but um, yeah, it, to me, that's more fundamentally of a bullish market and price discovery stage, early adoption, revolution technology, and now it's becoming global digital collateral. That's a lot of what it, um, what futures based ETFs did, and I don't think a lot of people understand that yet. It made just Bitcoin becoming digital collateral, the cash and carry trade is huge. Now the stock market is by most measures the most expensive in history relative to GDP, some of those how, those kind of things. And it's been supported by the Fed for years. So that's when people say, oh, the Fed's gonna taper and tighten. I'm like, yeah, sure. The minute the stock market wobbles, all bets are off for taping and tapering. They're going taping, <laughs> tapering and tightening. <laughs> I should try to say that three times real fast. All bets are off for that, and they go right back to providing liquidity because there is organic deflationary trends in the market that was way very much predominant before COVID. The book "The Price of Zamar" by Jeff Booth really um, brings that out, and I see that in commodities clearly. We've had a blip in that trend. The Fed is fighting that organic deflationary environment by providing liquidity. Now, yes, last year with COVID had to provide for any liquidity, potentially, particularly because the government shut everybody down, made them stay home, become day traders. Um, but as we move forward, I, I don't see what stops this, which is all bullish for Bitcoin. It's typically is bullish for, for gold, but just not as much in the past. It's more bullish for Bitcoin. It used to be good for silver too. Well, that's also kind of fallen by the wayside. That's the world's going digital. Bitcoin's in that space. And the stock market also is in a space that it's the most expensive in history. Um, and at some point, it will have mean reversion. It just, you know, some of us have been thinking this for five years. And we, and most of us have given up thinking, oh, the Fed's, the Fed's always going to be their savior, which means at some point, it's just not going to work anymore. But for now, it's good. And you just look at the chart, you go straight up. You know what happens when that happens, you know, escalator up, elevator down. Sometimes you got to be careful. And I see better opportunities in Bitcoin. I've heard a professional manager say that I fully expect a good dip in both markets and full correction. But the first thing I would buy would be Bitcoin and crypto. That's what I heard someone else say. And I'd have to kind of think that's probably what markets are thinking too. $100,000 Bitcoin. Why do you think that's inevitable? What's the timeline? 
Yeah, exactly. So as a strategist, I always have to be careful timeline. Inevitable, it's just, first of all, it's simply the trajectory. Um, Bitcoin has a tendency to, um, their stock to flow points to 135 as the next key level. So that's one level. Um, another level is just looking past performance. It has a tendency to lock up to 1,000 and add a zero to 10,000, add a zero to 100,000 is next. Now, it, it overshot 10,000 and it's hung out at that level for essentially four years, 2017 to 2020. Um, boom, and we start, you know, broke out above there. Um, so it's past performance, and then you look at cycles with the ha halving, halvings. Last year was a halving. Typically, after halvings, it does the best. It makes sense. You cut supply, and I also look at it. It should be doing it at a slower pace in the past because of maturity and adoption. And I look at what's changing with on the demand adoption side. It's accelerating. I mean, and I don't see it doing anything but accelerating. So here's a simple thing I like to do as a strategist. What's the trend? Define the trend. Is it enduring? And extrapolate to the future. That's all I'm doing. And is and I have to make the assessment: Are there fundamental underpinnings strong enough to continue that trend? Yes. If anything, it's more so than ever. It's Bitcoin, in part, as far as most portfolios, is a fraction. I hear it's less than one percent. It's fully going to get up. I think to closer to, um, you know, it's got a, it's, it's a great it's a great hedge on on gold, a hedge on bonds, um, and it's getting there. And it's just early days so to me this is where we are i don't know what trips it up but i'm really impressed with things like the book the bitcoin standard i read it i think it was 2018 at first i was like oh this is kind of pie in the sky stuff and every day that goes by safety dynamis's predictions have been right <laughs> i don't see why it should stop so just that's the next key threshold and then there's um so a couple other indicators i watch but i like the um the uh, stock to flow I like the uh, tendency to add zeros from a thousand to ten to ten thousand to hundred thousand. And as far as time frame, I got to be careful with that one. But it's, it's it's I think it's the next key level. It's going to find a plateau and and, tra and trade around for a while. People would argue uh, when Bitcoin went to twenty k, it was the winter, and and here we are. It's almost the winter time, so there must be something lining up. I've been hearing that since I was working exclusively precious metals back in like during the the bull run in uh, silver and then in uh, in uh, gold. And so everyone would talk about, oh, it's, it's, it's seasonal. There's seasonal attributes to these price increases. Do you agree with that? I've never seen any correlation, but I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. It was always you see on that seasonals in all markets. You know, clearly there isn't gold around Diwali and things like that in festivals. And then it's clearly in, in energy um, because of heating demand and sources like and, and driving season and very clearly in eggs because of seasonal things. Now, Bitcoin also, I've heard and one of the highest correlations is to the stock market because it's a, it is a risk asset. But the um, fact is, this is the t this time of year. Um, it has a tendency that November is one of its best months. There was actually one year, I think it was November 2013, was a major distortion. It was up 400%. So you have to be careful with that. But we look at some of the biggest bull years. Last year was a really good period in 2017. Of course, that put in the peak. But I think it's also psychological. It's a time of year that, okay, if you have not been allocating to it, if you haven't performed, it outperformed the market. And you got to pad your books a little bit. And this is one of the best performing assets in history. Man can't kind Bitcoin and Ethereum out there together. So the way I like to look at it is if you hold gold and bonds, you're kind of naked. If you don't have some Bitcoin in that space and you got to have some Ethereum too. And I sense on a global scale, every single ma money manager on the planet all knows they, they the pendulum's completely swung. Okay. I can no longer claim it's silly internet money. I can't be ignorant. I have to at least why take the risk of, Grandpa or grandma, why weren't you involved with the biggest asset class uh, transformation in history of mankind? Versus if you lose one or two percent, not a big deal. To me, that's what's happened. The pendulum swung. Every asset manager gets it. And they're finally just getting the, the vehicles to do it efficiently. That's what an ETF in the U.S. did. It added legitimization. It's not a good vehicle to do it futures base you have to you have to pay into the contango but it opens up massive cash and carry anybody who holds bitcoin who can buy physical bitcoin sell out in the few sell the futures and just roll their futures has almost virtually risk-free money last year was 20 percent and not including slippage now it's priced in around 10 percent. that trade has to be done i just look at it. if i wasn't here and i could run a hedge fund that's what i'd be doing you leverage up five to 10 to one and you boom, you don't have to take directional risk. Just do the Bitcoin or Ethereum cash and carry against futures. Those are listed futures. That has just massive inflows and it just adds legitimization. And what I've heard is 
family offices, pension funds, endowments, and, and you name it, all have to have some exposure in their early days, and they just don't have good vehicles to do it, but they're coming, coming fast. And that's the way I see the whole macro of the space um, developing. And then you have this incident with <laughs> the situation where I have to admit, uh, Justin, I never even dreamed of it's become in the vested interest of the U.S. to adopt cryptos with proper regulation because it pushes back on our arch rival now, which is China. And that's something we might see happen at the state level before we see it happen at the federal level. We see states like Wyoming, for instance, already moving in that direction. And I know that I think from my sense here in Idaho is that it went, it's not a, too far of a leap for it then to creep over in Idaho, which is the state right next door, namely because I think the politicians uh, are hanging out with each other. They know each other and they're talking and they're seeing the success that's happened in Wyoming with Kraken moving there, Avanti Bank, although not as uh, not operational is setting up there. And that at the very least has been great PR for Wyoming. So I guess, do you have any comments on how that adoption might take place? Well, I I think you nailed one of the most advantageous things about the states. You know, those of us who lived overseas realize the states are just, we have such a a benefit to the rest of um, every country on the planet. And one of the key things is competition between states. I mean, I'm in Miami and I'm just loving this discourse between the new uh, mayor of of New York, Eric Adams, and um, Mr. Suarez here about allocating and getting some of their paychecks in Bitcoin is because they're fighting for that talent. The problem with New York is it's expensive and they have some of the old guard, but the whole Anybody with talent who wants all moving, in, where they're not going to get taxed to death. Um, but I love that competition. To me, that's the key thing that is the benefit of the United States. And it's nothing, you can't just do that in a communist, quote unquote, potentially dictatorship in China. There's just, it's fear of, fear of falling behind, a fear of, um, of be considered um, corrupt or not doing what the, what the boss says versus here, we all compete. And it makes us better. And sure, there's a lot of uh, nuances. But to me, that's one of the most significant things about what's happening is the states are competing. The high tax states are losing. High tax, high welfare states are losing. And that COVID accelerated. And crypto assets and digitalization and technology is do you want to you know, be left behind or are you going to adopt and adapt? And sorry for California, but you left for a reason. And 12% state tax is just crushing. I fully see Silicon Valley moving. I mean, it's just... That's what happens. And there's this great book by Dominic uh, Frisbee called Daylight Robbery. I love it. And it just points out how everything in in, in our lives, a lot of things are driven by tax. I'll end with this. Nothing to do with religion. So why is Jesus of Nazareth? Why why was he born in Bethlehem? Because of tax. (laughs) They're running from the tax man. They had to go there for the census. So to me, that's the key thing. States competing, properly um, incentivized states will win. And you're seeing the company. Why did Elon Musk move to Texas? Why did Kathy Wood move to Florida? Why did you move to Idaho? Why did I move to Florida? It's all happening. Um, and partly because we want opportunity and upside. And that's why our ancestors came here. Much easier now, but for opportunity and upside. How do you price in a paradigm shift like we're seeing right now to Bitcoin? Um, yeah. You mentioned that the, the Bitcoin standard, you, ma- you mentioned uh, just like an asset transformation. Now, now like, can that be priced in? And then I guess uh, also, can you talk about your paradigm shift from looking at the trees to kind of looking at the forest? Yeah, the one thing I've learned, I remember I was in the trading pits in 1988 and talking to one of my bosses and he was pointing all these negative things about the bond market. And I was bullish. I'd only been in the business for a few months. And I remember realizing, oh, this is someone who's clearly much smarter, clearly dug in the weeds more, more than me. And he's missing sight of the forest because of he's focusing too much in the trees. It's a lesson I learned really early is focus on the forest and particularly also i don't always have the intellectual capability to focus on all the trees <laughs> say someone like you might and some of my much smarter colleagues so to me it's a macro forks how you price in and put quantify this paradigm shift is much more difficult i just say it's bullish <laughs> prices should go higher and then i'll throw my technicals to help define that and that's why i look at bitcoin right now it's probably put in a good floor at least a few weeks ago i thought it was putting a good floor around fifty thousand, and it's going to be heading towards a hundred thousand now i think that floor has moved up to sixty thousand, and it's there in very good a very good floor just about four thousand good ceiling around five thousand but it's just incrementally higher and i checked up my technicals they're not overbought and i focus on weeklies a good lesson i learned is don't look on daily charts just going to make you lose your hair. See, I can tell I used to do that. So to me, it's how you, but it's the focus on the force. And that is 
when I get, it's the questions I get asked. I don't have any inside scoop, but when I hear some major institutions on the planet asking me about cryptos, explain this stuff to us, Mike, explain it to me. And I see the headlines. I just love, you know, there's nothing like being addicted to information. It's the headlines that really matter versus sensational ones. Like the key headline that really struck me Q1 was every single entity that said they were getting into or getting exposed to cryptos because quote unquote, organic demand pull our customers want it. Jamie Dimon said it recently because our customers want it. So I need to know, but it's consensus across the board from every place. And I think it's because smarter people on the planet don't want to get blockbustered. They don't want to get Kodak and they see what's happening. And it's just simple insurance risk reward policy. Why do we have life insurance? I don't expect to, to die, but I got to have it. Hopefully I won't. Why do you have car insurance? This to me is part of that life insurance stage. We're not even near that part of our allocation stage, the 60-40 mix. I published almost two years ago, I wrote 60 39 one is kind of the joke, meaning that one is Bitcoin. And to me, it's it's becoming that significant. And the question for us, Justin, is what stops it. There's going to be blips, but we're at that stage now. So I think every dip is going to be limited. Um, it'll be just about how much we back up from new highs. And that's the stage we're in. We've already had a pretty significant correction this year, which means solid base foundation for moving higher. And it's the fundamentals. That just watch the headlines. What what entity is not have an itchy trigger finger to start allocating to some form of cryptos, if not through equities, um, and something to do with that. And, and then you look at things, what's happening with NFTs. Here's the bottom line. NFTs, they're all denominating Ethereum. So if you're Disney or, or uh, Budweiser, or any entities, but NFT, you got to buy Ethereum first before you buy the NFT. And then you look at things at crypto dollars, 130 billion, a billion right now. Last year was one-tenth that. Every single one of them are denominated in Ethereum. Like, okay, commodity guy, I don't need to know much more about those trees. All I see is demand for Ethereum. That's the force. What of Tesla and MicroStrategy and then El Salvador of also making Bitcoin purchases to add, I believe, to their treasury? What does that portend for Bitcoin, I guess, versus something like Ethereum at this point? I think on the NFT front, for instance, I don't think we've realized the coming demand in Ethereum. I think that these big multinationals haven't necessarily dipped in to the NFT space like they very well may very quickly. But in Bitcoin, we have seen large allocations into Bitcoin. Can you speak, I guess, to that at all? What is there? Does it portend something different for Bitcoin than the rest of the cryptocurrencies? Or what does it say at least about Bitcoin? Uh, well, Bitcoin, digital reserve asset, global collateral and a world going digital. No one's project, no one's liability. End of subject. It's the most pure crypto there ever will be. And I should be careful saying that because it's just, it's just, the, my son runs a note and he's not being told by Vitalik or anybody what to do. Now, I'm not putting down Ethereum, but the key thing that a lot of the naysayers are missing in this space is what this is doing for the S part of ESG on a global basis. It's just one of the most revolutionary things in the world. For, we're blessed being born in this country, like Warren Buffett says. I mean, I'm, uh, it's just we've had all the uh, opportunities. It's our fault if you didn't do well in this country. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Everything's laid out for you. And just work hard and you're good. Most people on this planet don't have that. But now they have the access to digital property rights, which is how Mark Yusko, the fund manager, I listened to a podcast this week and I'm addicted to him, like with yours. I'll, <laughs> is, that's what NFTs are. They're digital property rights. And people in the world have nothing can get access to a, the property right of a Bitcoin and Ethereum on their phone. And there's a quote that more people have phones or access to a phone on this planet than, um, than toilets. Um, so to me, that's a revolution that's happening. It's really lifting up the masses. I mean, the thing is also, it's created a lot of multi-young billionaires, multi-billionaires in this country can, um, who have a, who are really out to make the world a better place. And um, now the U.S. government is starting to figure out this is good for the government. So to me, this is what's happening that a lot of the naysayers just don't get yet. Like Jamie Dine, when he said, I just don't care. I think that might have potentially ended his career, Mark the Peacock. And he's already been, you know, towards his twilight years because he obviously, that's a very callous thing you expect for, from a robber baron in 1920 um, about poor people because this is making their lives better. Um, you know, I'm descendants of European peasants, and so I guess that's still in my blood. And I think most Americans just, that's what we are. We're out to make the world better, and that's what it's doing. So you mentioned El Salvador. Mr. Bukele, I look at it as cost-benefit analysis, risk-reward. I can go down as just another 
you know, South American leader, or I can go down the George Washington of the whole South America. What the heck? <laughs> I might as well take that risk. And sure, very imperfect. Every leader on the planet and every major person who's ever been become known to history is clearly imperfect, but he did one key thing. And it's also a unique thing how he did it uh, with making it legal tender is what's the risk? Why not? We're not doing any better. Um, and so to me, that's what's happening. A lot of the, you have to have the bold first who just say fine, or the people, not so much bold. What is, what is courage? <laughs> no better options <laughs> sometimes. So that's what's happening. And I do want to emphasize that. And the key thing that it's really important to bring about is, is, is this proliferation of crypto dollars. I mean, they trade more than Bitcoin, Ethereum, and almost all the cryptos combined on a daily basis. Tether is just one. And then there's a dozen, dozen one of these because it's a better way to do business through digital assets. It's a better way to hold, accumulate, allocate property. And what are NFTs? Digital property rights, but you don't have somebody in between. At the state level, I think it's more likely that we will see a move to Bitcoin, like we saw in El Salvador, there's already states and there's already legislation being proposed to hold gold and silver, that the, the states should be holding gold and silver. And I think that it's not a big leap to go from gold and silver to Bitcoin. I think it is a bigger leap to go from gold and silver to Bitcoin to Ethereum, for instance. But I think that Bitcoin has this name brand recognition to where if uh, like Ron Nate in Idaho's legislation passes and the treasury starts holding gold, at least, that introducing Bitcoin isn't too far, uh, it's not asking too much more. So I'm curious now, there's predictions about million dollar Bitcoin. Do you see these as fan fantastical or is there perhaps something behind them? Uh, yes, <laughs> for both. <laughs> I, I'm All these pie in the sky estimates, I, pie in the sky estimates I heard for the last few years i was like oh yeah great and now i fully clearly can see bitcoin getting to a million dollars now it's a question of time so let's for let's look at a uh, 12 month horizon i think a hundred thousand dollars is clearly in the wings and just look at what the average price for bitcoin was in 2011 was around ten thousand dollars that's already a 10x it's one year now it initially got to 10,000 2017, knocked around, and we have you know, a lot of volatility, and now we're 10X from that 10,000 level. So what is a million dollars? It's 10X from 100,000. It's not that bad, difficult. Maybe it takes four to five years, but something has to change, Justin, the key thing. Something significant has to reverse, and these enduring trends, I see acceleration. Number one is adoption. Um, being adopted by state governments and uh, state um, state entities, I was really shocked that China made that took that risk. So when you're driving and living without insurance, that's what they just did. They're one of the lar they are the largest miner of gold on the planet. They've been um, allocating, trying to um, hoard gold as potentially as a reserve asset, and now they're making the bet that um, Bitcoin it doesn't need to be diversified with gold I'm like, with Bitcoin. I'm like, Good luck. <laughs> it's just why you take the risk. Put in one to two percent Bitcoin to protect your reserve assets. It's going there. Safeudin Amos predicted in his book that the Bitcoin standard, and I don't want to keep mentioning him, but it's clearly that trajectory. So for me to not get to a million dollars, something significant has to change and reverse, or we can simply say, what are the enduring trends? Will they stay the same? Clearly, we're going to a million dollars. Question time. Will they accelerate? That's what's been happening. Will they flatten out? Maybe. Will they reverse? Very unlikely. What's the probability? stay the same course is going there the world's going digital it's not that complicated and that's for me i focus on the force something really unpredictable has to mess us up this space i usually thought it was going to be some kind of technolo technological glitch but we've you know bitcoin's already survived the thousand cuts it keeps doing it and what happened this year was another major thing i was so impressed with was china kicked out basically um eliminated what a third of all mining, almost 40%. The market adjusted instantly, no central authority. This to me was what really tipped the scales in 2020. Now this, uh, 2021, that was, we're gonna look back and that, that was paradigm shift to get institutions say, okay, I believe it. 2020, it was when um, the market dropped and we had all these shutdowns and limits in the stock market and Bitcoin never stopped trading. Um, and then, and Bitcoin volatility continued to climb, volatility and everything else on the planet was going up. I looked at that as a macro guy. I'm like, 
that's revolution. I'm an ex pitch guy. And you know, when you can trade night sessions, but when the pits close, you can't trade. I'm like, they never close, never stop trading. And no one was in there to disrupt it. To me, that was paradigm shifting. 2021 is the major next paradigm shift. And it all just continues to trickle up, I guess, to more demand and more adoption. And like I said, something really unpredictable has to happen and significant. And every day that goes by, the probability of that happen, happening declines. We talked a lot about Bitcoin standard. We talked a little bit about your uh, tweet about US patriotism being a boon to Bitcoin. I'm curious, uh, can you talk a little bit about the retail public and the adoption of Bitcoin and how this might play a role in, in some of your predictions? It's going to become collateral for buying for assets for homes and that's not profound that's simply following the trend so another key thing that really kicked in last year was when paypal onboarded it i remember i was just went in and bought a hundred dollars worth that was so easy i'm like oh boy <laughs> so the difference in this country is it's a little more speculative i think people millennials look at it as investment and they will how many millennials buy gold even stocks they look at cryptos as their their kind of their opportunity i mean the stock market is at the highest ever compared to when i was young as a millennial, the stock market was still pretty well, fairly priced. Now it's like, uh, really? Uh, is it going to keep going? Boomers are gone, and you know we're not as big of an ass, uh, big of a, um, a bell curve moving that way. So, to me, in this country, um, it's just people understanding that yes, the U.S., as Michael Slayer says, does have a melting ice cube of a currency. Um, and I like to use that example of, you know, my parents bought their home in the 60s and it went up 10x. It didn't go up 10x. Value of piece of currency they bought it with declined. Um, and I like to use that example of purchase of using price of gold to measure other assets like farmland and stock market. It's stable over time. Problem is now that's starting to increase in the price of gold because gold's becoming less valuable because Bitcoin has taken over. So to me, that's where it is. It's the stage and everybody in this country, it's even the young people. Here's the way I like to, and I like to describe it is. A money manager friend of mine, I have a lot of those. At my age, that's what a lot of people do. Once you get out and leave Wall Street, you, you manage money for other people. Um, and, you know, like FIA, RIAs and stuff. His quote was, anybody who's under 30 gets it and is mostly involved. People between 30 and 50 are allocating and understand it. People over 50 are scared. <laughs> that's why I thought that was a good way to describe it. So I was on LinkedIn yesterday and I was looking at my page for gold, silver, Bitcoin. And in the bottom right, I have hashtags that I follow and the hashtags are gold, silver, and Bitcoin. So gold has 18,593 followers on LinkedIn. Silver has 3,071 followers on LinkedIn. Bitcoin has 442,031 followers on LinkedIn. And having been in gold and silver before entering the Bitcoin space, I do get a sense that Bitcoin has sapped a lot of what would have been silver bugs from silver, the silver investment, physical, into Bitcoin. So you mentioned like uh, gold's becoming less value because of Bitcoin. I guess like what's the outlook for gold? Has Bitcoin killed it? And then silver as well. Uh, we'll start with the worst right now. I'm very concerned about silver. Silver was the year it was supposed to bump up and jump to near 40 this year, particularly on the back of copper. Um, and it didn't, and I'm really, okay. Platinum is another one should be catching up. I've been bearish, you know, bullish platinum for a while just to catch up the palladium. It's got really good solid fundamental reasons to do that. It's not working. So I'm very concerned about precious metals, but the key thing is precious metals, most notably gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. I have to put them together. Most notably gold will always have a propensity, propensity to advance in terms of the fiat currency they're based in, most notably dollars, because there's unlimited supply of dollars. And they don't have that massive elasticity supply that other commodities do. The most unique example of supply elasticity is the grains. Prices went up this year, supply came up, prices are back down. So the way I look at gold is I'm bullish. I fully expect it to continue higher, but I cannot, as a prudent investor in the days when all he had was gold, precious metals, I think every prudent money manager on the planet knows I can't have go hold gold or they can't hold gold without some Bitcoin in the space because it is clearly being replaced. The question is extrapolating that in the future. And I fully expect, okay, trend your friend, stick with it. It's probably going to continue to happen. I think what's going to happen with gold is going to jump up to $2,000 an ounce. And that's probably never going to go back below at some point. Cause it's, it's a perfect bull market compared to not perfect compared to all our commodities. It's an enduring bull market. It's had a correction. I mean, it's only a year away from the all-time high. Crude oil, the enduring bear market, it's bounced up to the upper in the range. Its high is from 13 years ago. Why? There's a good reason. Copper just made a new high and backed off, but that high was from 10 years ago. So 
I think gold is going to still be one of the best best performing commodities, particularly for investors. You can buy and hold physical gold, silver, platinum, palladium, but you can't do it with crude oil. You got to roll, you have to own futures and roll those futures and they will cost you over time guaranteed. It always will go back to contango because that's normal. So there's the big difference. When people say, oh, commodity super cycle, I say it's happening in Bitcoin. Precious metals, you can't really own them anymore without Bitcoin. I don't really say Ethereum, Bitcoin, some Ethereum. And that's just the way, that's just existing trends. Justin, anybody who's listening to this has got a good reason for those trends to reverse. I'd like to hear it. I might not listen too long because I will see if I agree with you. I see those trends accelerating. It's that, not that complicated, but there will be bumps in the row. And I view this as a pretty good bump in, in gold this year. When people talk about inflation, I'm like, okay, well, how's the long bond doing and gold doing? They both aren't point, pointing to inflation. <laughs> no, they're pointing to, pointing to predominant deflationary trends. So things like Bitcoin, when people say it's inflation hedge, yes, yeah, someday it will be, but right now it's in that price discovery stage, and that's the big difference. And it's in the process of replacing gold in portfolios. So if we see deflation, then what will that portend for gold and silver, particularly silver, and then Bitcoin as well? Well, it's good for all the above because it's the alternative, not so much silver. Silver is much more industrial now. 20 years ago, it was, <clears throat> maybe it was 30% industrial. Now it's over 50%. I solar panels and all that fun stuff and electrification, decarbonization and, and uh, anesthetics, you know, and, and um, things, you know, for medical purposes. But, um, but it's not happening. I <laughs> mean, it's just a silt supply comes on too easy every time it goes up and it's still kind of stuck at this price at $24 an ounce. The, the key thing is deflation is the natural, organic, human trend and it's accelerating at a greater pace it just had a blip in that trend for a good reason covid and we're going to resume that trend so the way i look at inflation look at next year we're going to measure prices from the highest bar in commodities ever the bloomer commodity index is at the highest price ever the last time it made new highs it's right around here the cpi within a year or two was already it was running negative a few years later why because it has to measure oh, a year over year and so to me, that's the measure that's going to matter. And I fully expect a big macro picture that's most enduring trend in the planet that's really worked well for me this year is the de declining yield of U.S. government bond yields. Right now, the long, the 30-year long bond is 1.8. I don't go to the 10-year because I fully expect that one to go negative or zero. The 30-year bond has the most basis points left, 1.8%. Um, I started trading when they were closer to 9%, and that was in the 80s. And that trend's been down forever. And... It's one of the key indicators this year is, Justin, one of my favorite trades so far this year is the, the and I'll be publishing on this by the time, the time we speak, is when an enduring trend becomes against consensus, beware. And that's what happened with bonds this year. Every single strategist, with the exception of few, was said yields are going up and it's the end of the bear market in yields or bull market for prices. And that's when I turned to myself and say, well, that's how I got promoted from the trading pits in Chicago to New York, was just being bullish bonds. So why should I change that? Particularly what's happening with rapidly, tech rapidly advancing technology, pushing down the price of things, commodities that's happening, and then what's happening with demographic shifts. I mean, uh, every population in the country, most know this country are getting older. And we're becoming, we have a glut of savings and the stock market's really expensive. So here's my outlook for next year. We're going to get a wobble in the stock market. I don't know how long or how much. And what I see is with that persistent declining long bond is it's pricing in for that more extreme deflationary force kicking, resuming. This is nothing new. Resuming next year. Remember, it'll be more than about two years past COVID and accelerating because we've had this blip in this trend where we created these higher prices and corn and soybeans and natural gas and copper and lumber, where you can now bring in more of it. And that's going to mean deflation because you're measuring it from a higher plateau. Has silver been demonetized? Did Bitcoin demonetize oh, yeah. silver? Yeah. Gold replaced silver, clearly. I mean, this goes back to um, uh, Sir Isaac Newton running the uh, mint in, um, in England and deciding, I think, and he, I think he made set the exchange rate at 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold, and he focused on silver as uh, gold as the uh, base currency. And then um, William Jennings Bryan, I think was in the early 19th century, trying to get the U.S. on a silver standard. The world went to a gold standard, and silver became um, 
meh. I mean, silver is synonymous with in most Latin American countries with money, but it's it it was replaced by gold, and it worked out well because it it had too much elasticity supply. And um, now Bitcoin's replacing gold. It's nothing new. It's just been around for a while. And I love when people say, "Oh, it's been at store value for five thousand years." I'm like, "Yeah." And so the horse was the only the best, the quickest form of transportation for human beings for most of mankind until we created the automobile, and that's what happened. You see, so in the U.S. Constitution, for instance, there is a bimetallic standard that is outlined, and I kind of have a, it's more of a thought experiment than anything that perhaps U.S. patriotism, like you suggested, is a boon to Bitcoin, could be a boon as well to silver. However, we don't see that trend. When you go to a silver conference, for instance, the messaging is a lot less enthusiastic than you see from the Bitcoiners, for instance. A lot of the same issues, uh, economically speaking, that Bitcoiners talk about today used to be the subject matter that you would hear about as silver gathering, for instance, particularly those who are interested in physical silver. However, they seem a little bit more lost these days. They often like talk about green energy and industrial demand, not monetary demand for silver. But I'm curious, could theoretically U.S. patriotism be a boon to silver anymore? Or has that... Toast, the ship has sailed. So here's what, I'm a broad macro commodity strategist. And I look over at commodities and I see massive excitement, bull market fundamentals, decline in supply, increase in demand, and adoption in cryptos, most notably Bitcoin and Ethereum. I look over commodities, Silver's met, stuck at the same price. It's not doing well, and it's it's divergent weakness this year. Good luck. I mean, okay, maybe it gets to 20, and then goes up to 30, and goes up to 30, and goes down to 20. Right now, I don't see a bullish up case for for silver. I gave up. I mean, because I see, why should I waste my time and effort on something that people keep saying, keep you know, it's just not working. Same with platinum. I'm not saying getting bearish, but it's just not working. And I look at this other class that's taken off. I look at copper peak. Why? Because China said it's going to peak. And they have, there's any country that's going to make it peak, it's China. And that's the key thing to remember in commodities. China is in a secular decline. They've cut their triple R rate. They're having problems with property. I've been pointing this out for years. The incremental GDP growth has been declining. That means anything that's industrial metal wise is going to have a problem. China's in secular decline. And now they're having major problems with, um, they're pushing back on free market capitalism. They're having problems with their electricity use. It's all classic what you'd expect in a centrally planned economy. They've never been able to keep up. Sure, taking a billion people out of poverty and lifting up to maybe $10,000 average income a year, great. They're the ones who push them in the first place. And now we have this potentially paranoid leader who's trying to segregate and uh, consolidate power. And Good luck. It just they don't have that free market capitalism and flow discourse. That's bad for all industrial related metals and several is industrial metal. It just it is. I mean, it's been replaced by gold and then we have gold um, being replaced by Bitcoin. So I look at it as, and then crude oil. Why is crude oil? I'm not excited about crude oil. Picture ourselves 10 years from, go, yeah, from now. EVs will proliferate. They'll be much cheaper than automobiles, than internal combustion, and the supply will be continuing to have a problem because we can create more of it with less than we have in the past. That's been the trend in the last 10 years. Why should that end? Total consumption of electric of um, liquid fuels in this country is the same as it was 20 years ago. That's only because of efficiency. It's going down now because of just modern technology. Then I look over, so I don't see any major upside in sustainable upside in commodities because of elasticity supply and elasticity demand. I look over at cryptos and I see the opposite. I see enduring bull markets, massive volatility, but from a guy who wants something fun and exciting to focus on that's got a lot of upside, Bitcoin and Ethereum. We've had the honor of sitting down today with Bloomberg's crypto and commodity strategist, Mike McLone. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today. Thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the next time. Likewise, and thank you everyone for listening.